Good evening. The opinions and statements voiced by our guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this network. Enjoy the shows. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. And thank you once again for joining the Full Spectrum Project. I am your host, Brian Clune, and I am joined by my co-host. Hi, hi y'all. I'm Pete Haviland. I'm here in the lovely, rainy Houston, Texas. Rainy? I'm sitting rainy. in like 89 degree weather with the sun shining. And, and you always complain about California. Huh. I don't, I don't complain about California. Oh, yes, that's you me. do. Oh, that's you? Yes. Oh. That's it. That's Angie. That's Angie Mole. She's, uh, she'll be joining us at the top of the hour for our Weird World News segment. Anyway, today we are joined by Catherine Ramsland, who is a forensic psychologist and also investigates haunted locations and crime scenes with an eye for the forensics. So, uh, Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Um, Now, before we get started, Pete, remember I was just telling you that our Toys R Us uh, became a Hobby Lobby, right? Yes, yes. So, I went in there, and I'm kind of a modeler from way back, um, usually military type models and i knew they had a bunch of them so i kind of went in yeah. there and oh oh my lord I, I, yeah i know I, you i knew you did some modeling yeah I yes know I, yes I, I do some modeling i'll yeah. send i'll send you pictures of me in the speed no no no, um, no no the last pictures you sent me uh they were confiscated by the postal police so i don't need them is that why the rate never mind yeah um, no, that's what happened that's what happened that's right. why you're on that list now I was wondering about that. Thanks so much for that. I thought Wyatt did it. No. All right, so, no, no. so anyway, um, I'm wandering around Hobby Lobby trying to, you know, get my, you know, the lay of the, the store. And I saw this one dude. I mean, he was just, and it is California. So you kind of have to uh, get used to weird people. But this guy was just being really weird. So I was kind of like following him around to see if he was going to steal something. And uh, he walks down this one aisle where they have all of the uh, art supplies and things like that. And the guy actually started dipping his testicles in the glitter. And it was, I, I mean, it was. And you get the stick ready. It was just all pretty nuts. I couldn't believe it. Oh, uh, Catherine, I'm so sorry. They get worse every every week. <laughs> That's a bad Wait, thing. what what do? Uh, never mind. Never mind. Uh, uh, guess, huh? <laughs> I want to sharpen the stick for next week. Just going to let you know. Uh, no. I'll put some broken glass on it. Yeah. Just yeah. no. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, um, to get really, started. Really, 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 Brian, a, a, a glitter joke? It's <laughs> California. Uh huh. Okay. Come on. I let's, just live, move, let, let, let's, let's just move along. <laughs> I, I, live, I live fairly close to, you know, Hollywood, the, the glitter capital of the uh, world. Uh, yeah, I understand. So, I understand. You know, let's just move along. Okay. There's nothing to see here. Let's move along. <laughs> so, uh, Catherine, um, as a forensic psychologist, um, when, when did you decide to combine the study of parapsychology with forensic psychology. Oh, and Catherine, I'd be really interested to see what you what your assessment of Brian is. So, if we need to move <laughs> another person in, that would be great. Uh, yeah. stop it. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Do you want me to answer the question, or you don't want me to? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, please do. Please do. <laughs> but 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 please answer my question, not Pete's. All right. It started with the paranormal when I was a little kid. 
So I was very interested in ghosts. My mother would give me ghost stories to read. So that came long before anything forensic. Um, it, to me, it was, you know, I just, I was fascinated with ghost stories. And then I, I went, actually, this all started when I went into the vampire subculture undercover <laughs> during about 20 years ago, more than 20 years oh, ago. Oh, wow. And because I was looking for a woman who had disappeared while she was investigating them. And through that, I acquired a supposedly haunted ring at, from one of the vampire people. And I, at that point, I got an invitation to be among some ghost hunters. And since I already had an interest in paranormal subjects, I started doing these investigations in the, the around with ghost hunters. So that was before I even got involved at all with forensics. So that all, all those things, they turned into books and I came before I then went to back to school because I had actually had a PhD in philosophy and then I went back to school for forensic psychology and criminal justice. So then it seemed natural marriage of the two techniques because they were both investigative and both had their shortcomings and both had their advantages. And I had friends among the ghost hunters like Mark Nesbitt, who's my co-author on, on these two books. And so we would st set up these investigations using both techniques. So the ghosts came first and the serial killers came second. <laughs> Um, all right. So what made you first think about crime scenes as being haunted? <laughs> um, it seems like many crime scenes already have crime or many hauntings already have crime scenes as part of it. Not all of them, but certainly you'll hear about murders. Uh, being murder areas being haunted, so I, I think that was just a natural overlap. Um, it, when I where I lived, and I wrote a, a book called Bethlehem Ghosts, where I live in Pennsylvania, and I had noticed then that a lot of the the stories were about crimes that had happened in the area. So then I wrote a book with the coroner, um, murders in the Lehigh Valley. Because, uh, because there was so much overlap between the crimes and the ghost stories. But I don't know that I, I consciously thought, oh, some of these are crimes. I think it was just a natural overlap because so many of these tales do involve crime scenes. You know, you have, you have your ghosts in the battlefields, of course. You'll have, um, you know, the, the, woman, the, the woman in white waiting for her husband to return from, you know, on ship or something like that. But I think quite often you have haunted crime scenes. So when we decided to, we had written a book called Paranormal Forensics, you know, where we put the two methods together in cases and some of the investigations we did. But, but it seemed a natural follow-up to write haunted crime scenes and just compile a book full of stories about hauntings that did involve crimes as their basis. So it, I don't think it was a, you know, like consciously aware as much as, wow, a lot of these hauntings involve crime scenes. So let's just do that. Okay. Well, I, you know, it, it, it makes sense. Um, I, I've, I've always thought that the act of violence, um, for for most crime scenes are probably um, a catalyst for that type of um, haunting anyway. Just, you know, e even if it's uh, what we call a residual haunting, the, mm -hmm. uh, ju just the act of violence itself will leave uh, the imprint. Um, so th this one is a little bit, um, this question is a little bit on the personal side for me. Uh, due to a, a book I wrote called uh, Hollywood Obscura. But in uh, the introduction to your book, Haunted Crime Scenes, you mentioned that Marilyn Monroe would be one to include in the book uh, due to the fact that you were unsure about whether it was a suicide or a murder. 
Now, I was wondering if you were or aware. An or an accident. Or an accident, correct. Um, I don't know if you were aware, but in 1992, uh, the Giancana family published a book called Double Cross, the explosive inside story of the mobster who c controlled America. Yeah, it's a long title. Um, anyway, in that book, they admitted that Robert Kennedy had them murder Monroe uh, by use of a specially designed nebutal. Nembut I always get that wrong. Nembutal uh, oh. suppository. Were you aware of that? Sure. Oh, she you were. She liked to do enemas. Well, yeah, she did. Um, she but, was addicted um, to enemas. I'm sorry. She, she was addicted to them. Yeah, and I mean, one of the reasons that she was uh, um, addicted had to do with the uh, studios actually um, are the ones who got her hooked on them, shall we say. And then she kind of went a little bit nuts on them. Um, so with the admission, I guess you could call it, of the uh, Giancanas, um, do you think that they were telling the truth or, you know, cause uh, like I said, in, in the forward, you mentioned, you're not sure what, what it was. No, because that would have shown up in the autopsy very easily. Uh, well, no, if I, I, don't, if, I don't know that that's necessarily true. There's so many stories about it, but one story that stands out after many years, a lot more information came out since her autopsy. Okay. Uh, story that stands out is that she would often overdose and then call someone to get help because it was a was a, a way to get attention and her hand was on the phone so it could easily be that she overdosed without really intending to kill herself which would make it an accidental overdose instead of suicide or homicide right so that's um, what I do. well because uh, i was getting getting back to the autopsy um Noguchi actually thought it was rather unusual that she had such a high dose of Nembutal in her system, but could not find any trace of it in her stomach and could also find no trace of a suppository, which would go back to this supposed uh, suppository that... Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember if... Uh, no, they, didn't, they did not complete a toxicology report. Um, they threw her stuff away before everything was done. Well, they, they did do a minor uh, toxicology uh, on her. But again, the, when, when the report finally came out, it is stated in the autopsy that uh, there was a large amount of Nembutal found in her system, but they couldn't find how it got into her system. And that, that was one of the things that always kind of, you know, uh, to me was like, hmm, okay, that this is kind of weird. I think that would have shown up in her intestines. I mean, she was uh, known to do these these enemas. So you'd have right. to he did an he just did an incomplete job. I'm not sure that... We would say that. I mean, I know he was young at the time and he was, you know, really just beginning, but and they did a pretty comprehensive psychological autopsy on her as well. And a lot of the stuff that we've learned since then, you know, just, I don't, it's so easy to make up stories about her because, because there's so many holes. So I, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about that. Yeah, well, I, I do know that uh, the um, her psychologist, when he finally released those um, uh, tapes of, of during their sessions, that uh, I found it rather interesting that she admitted that she was not having an affair with JFK, but was having an affair with RFK and had been trying to get the president to actually tell Robert to back off. Um, and then the fact that there are witnesses that saw Robert Kennedy at Maryland's house early that morning when he was supposed to be in San Francisco, the whole thing just kind of has this weird vibe to it, if you, get, if you understand what I'm saying. I do, but I also know that people love conspiracies. <laughs> you can build 
build this conspiracy out of all the holes in the story and in the investigation. But, um, you know, and the people who didn't say things, who should have said things at the time, but who since since then said, you know, told what they know. But I don't know who's lying and who's telling the truth. And I think that's a story. The story of Marilyn Monroe will never be definitively solved just because there are so, there's too much ambiguity. Well, at least not until we figure out which uh, place she's haunting and then go there and hopefully have a conversation with her. Because she does tend to haunt quite a few different locations, which I, I found was uh, rather interesting as well. Her house, the Roosevelt, uh, there's this one restaurant for some reason that uh, is has left my mind with you know the, the name of it. Um, and then also her oh, yeah, great site. Anybody, anything for, for all the hauntings. And all the people with all their equipment, she has never told anybody anything. Well, that's true. <laughs> that is very true. Um, something you might get a kick out of, and um, I had mentioned it to Pete uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, my wife and I had gone to uh, the Westwood Memorial Cemetery. And the last time I had been there, Hugh Hefner had not passed yet. And Marilyn Monroe's uh, headstone um, in the in the wall uh, was just covered with lipstick was pink you could see the lip marks well when we went a few weeks ago now it's Hugh Hefner's gravestone and uh, in the wall which by the way is right next to Marilyn Monroe's and it's funny because now his has all the lipstick marks on it and hers is almost empty so I thought that was kind of funny and I I had mentioned it to Pete and one of our guests that I, I was wondering if Mar Marilyn Monroe was coming out and kissing on Hef <coughs> It's possible. I don't know. Back, back to the glitter jokes. Uh, no, that was, that was not a glitter joke. <laughs> Although, if, if you want, I can probably come up with one or two more. <laughs> if you're going to ever ask me to give you a definitive truth about an ambiguous story like that, you're not, it's never going to happen. I'm not going to give that to you because I, I just, that's not the way my mind works. I, I don't immediately decide because somebody makes logical sense that is the truth because logic is not the same thing as truth. That's true. I agree with that. Like how I did Catherine, that. That's <laughs> Catherine, I have a question for you. Um, yeah. What do you, what do you think or how, or what, how do you think that, uh, that folks experience these ghosts like at crime scenes or at houses or whatever? What do you, what do you think is going on in the human mind that, that people experience these things? Well, I think it depends on the point of view first, because if it's somebody okay. who has an association with the crime, or victims, or surviving, you know, survivors, they're going to have a different perception than a total stranger coming up on you know, a house and not even knowing what happened there and seeing something. So okay. it really is, is going to be about point of view, because certainly those who know something or expect to see something are going to have the tendency to project onto whatever they see. They'll see an, you know, a face in the window, or they'll hear children crying or something like that because that's what they already expect. Um, right. Really, it depends on, on who, who the person is and what their association is with the, with the you know, okay. incident or their location. Okay. So... Uh what you're saying is, is a lot of times people go in with these preconceived ideas uh, from maybe from what they've heard from other people on what kind of what is going on there. And they go in and will automatically have an experience at least similar to that because they've already gone in with this notion. Not automatically, but the tendency is there. I mean, if you're if you're a ghost hunter and you have a location you're going to because you've heard it's haunted. Okay. You're kind of set up to expect certain things. That doesn't mean you're going to see or hear anything at all. There's no guarantee just because you expect it. But you, but if you do see or hear something that's kind of ambiguous, like like an odd glint of light in the window, your tendency will be to see something in it that maybe isn't there. And that would be a very different experience from a person who just comes up to the place without knowing any of the history and sees something. Right, because they have no expectation of what to see, but something does happen. That's that's different. So you're saying something like the power of suggestion, 
can cause a, can cause a person to project what they want to see? Absolutely. Happens all the okay. time. Okay. Yeah, I, th I, th I think that's also where we get a lot of um, the pareidolia that, that yeah. we see so often in, you know, in, in somebody's photos. Um, it, it, as somebody who analyzes photos, and I know Pete does as well, you know, we look at it and we're like, no, we don't see anything there. But the person will swear up and down. No, there is a face right there. And it's, you know, and we, we can tell it's pareidolia. But to them, I guess, because they went in thinking that they're going to find something that all of a sudden there it is. Yeah. And you can do the same thing if you with an odor or with a with a sound. Um, you know, you're on Gettysburg, you'll hear Pickett whispering to you. <laughs> yeah. Know what I mean? So the, yeah. the the context makes a big difference in terms of what you know and what you interpret as to what you think you're experiencing. Well, uh, absolutely. Uh, Pete, 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 Pete hold, hold on a minute. We, uh, sure. we need to take a station identification break, but uh, as soon as we get back, uh, uh, go ahead and ask your question, and uh, we'll be back in just a minute. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Paratalk Radio is your one stop for all things paranormal, the unknown, and the supernatural. Join us every Monday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central for discussions and guests on topics such as ghosts, hauntings, Bigfoot, UFOs, and more. This broadcast is rated M for mature and intended for listeners over 16 on paratalkradio.com. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcast. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. And you are back with the Full Spectrum Project. We have been speaking with Camp Catherine Ramsland. And uh, when we left, Pete, uh, I believe you had a question for uh, Catherine? Yeah, I did, but in my, it, it, but I had forgotten what it is. So I'm sure I'll pop up with it again. Oh, you yeah, know what? They, but, you know, do what? Uh, they they have these supplements for for old people. You might want to think about starting to. Hey, you know, hey, 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 hey. Uh, you know what? I, I will I will send you uh, a case of Geritol and uh, some Insure. Uh, I it'll be fine. Dude, you're almost you, ten years older than me. You're almost ten years older than me. Come on now. But I'm much better looking. 
Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, all right, so, um, Catherine, uh, what are some of the more well-known crime scenes in your book that you, you've discussed? Well, the, the Villisca in, in Iowa, the Villisca uh, house, which you can actually go stay overnight in if you pay enough money for a paranormal experience. That uh, was the site of eight people being murdered by an axe maniac, and that's, that's still unsolved. And, and one idiot paranormal investigator who I believe took a knife or an axe to himself. Fairly recent. In the house, you mean? Yeah, it, yeah. Was a couple, it was a couple years ago. The guy had started saying that he was being possessed by the murderer or something, and he took a knife or an axe to himself. I don't remember what it was. It was just kind of like, really? <laughs> yeah, he, he survived the event. But uh, yeah, he, he he stabs himself in the I think it was in the chest. Uh, I mean, sorry, in the gut. Yeah, that's a mentally ill person. Uh huh. Yes. yes. Well, the Borden House, another very famous one. In fact, they they've um, recreated it as kind of a bed and breakfast where they really play it up now. But before they did that, before those people bought it, I had mm-hmm. to overnight by myself in the Lizzie Borden House, which is very interesting. Um, there are several places in Savannah and in New Orleans that are pretty famous. The Mercer House, uh, the Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, is a haunted house, as are several uh, houses that Jim Williams, who's the star of that show, that he um, not only renovated but had supernatural experiences in. Uh, okay. there's, and there are some in California, the Nicole Brown Simpson House, or at least the yard. Mm-hmm area supposedly is haunted um you know battlefields but they're not crime scenes but certainly battlefields would qualify as you know major haunted kinds of places right i i now remember what i was going to ask okay fire okay you you better duck um (laughs) <laughs> um, do you remember here lately? I think there, there was a, a Gettysburg uh, supposed ghost that they caught on film. Uh, had you seen that? Um, oh yeah, yeah, I, think, I did, I did, I did. Yeah. What, what were your thoughts on that? Because me personally, I, I, I think it was condensation on the window, the windshield. Yeah, but what are your thoughts? That in fact on Facebook, right? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I think because. It was so quick and so, you know, undefined. Mm-hmm. It, it, it certainly could have been that, uh, or just some glint off the camera. So mm-hmm. I, at first it looked kind of interesting, and then I, after I thought, uh, I'm not so sure. But I saw yeah. something kind of like that at Gettysburg once. I was there at night once, and there was a man who who was walking across the the battlefield around by right before you go into the, do you guys know Gettysburg? Yes. All right. So right. I, in, I, I, grew, I grew up in Maryland. Okay. So right before you get to the high water mark and the, the angle and mm-hmm. all that pick his charge area. Um, and it was a, it was kind of a rainy night, not mm-hmm. rain, rain, but, but wet. And he can't, he was wearing white including like no like white belt or whatever he was kind of all white and he crossed the battlefield and then and then all of a sudden raised his arms over his head and and started waving them and then he mm-hmm. and he crossed over toward uh where the only thing that that was around was um general was it sherman general sherman's headquarters mm-hmm. who's the who's the yankee general for, for Gettysburg. Anyway, the Yankee General's headquarters, that's the only thing that was down there. And, I, and he disappeared behind a bush. So I ran over and I didn't see him anywhere. So I, I can't tell you that was a ghost, but I can tell you it was certainly somebody weird walking across. <laughs> and it was that area where those two things were seen on that, that particular um, photo or video, whatever that was. So that's why it caught my eye because I had been in that area and, and experienced something weird. But then I wasn't convinced by it just because it was so quick and then and then nothing. What would you consider uh, good evidence or for a a haunting? And have you ever ever experienced anything like that? Well, I'm always on the lookout. (laughs) I (laughs) was, as Scott Mulder would say. 
Uh, I okay. call it several ghost repellent because, because it never happens. <laughs> 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 but I've heard stories, and one is actually uh, in the book, and it was a pretty interesting story about um, uh, Ted Bundy's last victim, who was a 12-year-old girl. And they couldn't find her, and they had you know many, many acres in, in that area of Florida to search. They kind of narrowed it down by the, the type of sand that was in the back of the stolen van he had used that day. So they kind of could narrow it down, but they really... You know, didn't they had some psychics give them some information that was completely wrong? But then there was one woman who did this really interesting map that she had remotely viewed. Okay. And although she set it in the wrong, you know, really not in the right place at all, right. she had a number of items on the map that when they were in this one area, they noticed these two sinkholes joined by a canal, which was on her map. One of the officers said she said there are horses. I think to the south. He said, "Yeah, there used to be a horse farm over there." Right. And, and then another was picnic tables, and that was a campground. And and so she was right about all the things, which made them go back and search that area thoroughly. And as they realized they were near the sinkholes, they were within I think ten yards of the body, but it was underneath a collapsed paint shed, so they didn't see it. But when they, because of her vision, they went back and found her. And that, wow. I thought, was a very interesting story. That is very interesting. Didn't, didn't, Bun, didn't Bundy always uh, deny that he did anything with that 12-year-old? Uh, yes, because uh, when you're in prison, you don't want to admit to being a child killer. That's, that's right. Yeah. A good thing. Yeah, um, you, you, you won't last too long but, that way. He hinted no. at some, like when, when he was doing the interview with uh, Dobson, mm -hmm. he just he sort of, I'm not talking about that. So he didn't exactly deny it. And also he had admitted to killing a 13-year-old in, in Idaho uh, okay. earlier. So he didn't, he didn't fully take responsibility for it. But on the other hand, he really never outright denied it either. And they had tons of evidence on him. So. Okay. You know, he, he was definitely convicted rightly for that one. Oh, okay. Now, now you, you didn't mention it, but have you ever done any investigation into the DeFeo murders that uh, were uh, involved with the Amityville house? I haven't, you know, the Amityville house is, so, is, is such a... No, I'll just say no, because... You know, some of the demonologists got involved in that and made a lot of very strange statements. Let me right. say, um, I have I have been there, but I haven't done any investigation. I, I I'm pretty familiar with the things that he said. Um, right. You know, he at first he he organized him, and then and then he took the whole demon defense, and then. You know, drop that too. Same right. with Dennis Rader. Same thing. They often will do that. But um, I, I still think it's an interesting story. But it's to me, it's much more psychological than it is has anything to do with an Indian burial ground or you know any of that stuff. Well, that, yeah. they, what, that up, what, do you, what are your thoughts on what had happened with the murders, not the haunting, but the murders? Do you think it was uh, DeFeo the whole time? Um, there's also uh, thoughts out there that Don uh, killed the family and then he got mad and killed her. I mean, what well, are your that's thoughts? what he said. Yeah. 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 He, he's doing what is typical. Okay. Uh, a, a person in his circumstance to try to save himself by implicating somebody else. You know, the right. other did it kind of thing. I don't see that. Okay. Yeah, and then from, from what I understand also is that both him and his attorney uh, came up with this whole tell him it's a, uh, a demon and you were hearing voices so we can get the insanity uh, plea going. I doubt that. No? That, that would be an extremely unscrupulous and stupid attorney because that would, be, that would come out right away and mm -hmm. that's illegal. I mean, there certainly are attorneys who will hire psychologists and such to coach people into 
you know, to, to sort of coax something like that out of them. But I think Tafia already had that going in his head. And if and if he said anything, the attorney grabbed onto it. But I don't think the attorney originated it. I think Tafia did. Yeah, he, well, he, I, he, I think he, he just took it and kind of ran with it. And, yeah. and, yeah, he just kept changing his story. He's kind of like Jody Arias. Okay. You know, once one doesn't work, slip to another, slip to another. So no, I don't. I just I think that he's the one who came up with that. Yeah, well, I I do know I saw an interview with him uh, maybe about a year, year and a half ago, where he admitted that the uh, the whole demon thing was all made up right. uh, to get you know hopefully get an insanity plea. Uh, one of the reasons that I've always been a little into uh, not the haunting per se, but the 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 demonology part of it is that. At the time the Amityville horror, as they call it, was going on, we had a family member who was a priest at that um, uh, church. And uh, I remember him saying, no, none of that ever happened. (laughs) So, you know, it was one of those things where I I was always kind of. And it's funny, too, because I brought the book home and that's when my mom said, no, 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 no. Brother Jim was there. And I was like, oh, thanks, mom. You just ruined the book for me. (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah, I, you know, I think to even get involved with that story is to show that you're not really. That you're interested more in the sensational aspects of it, you know, because, you know, ever since the new people moved in. They didn't have anything happen at all. The, yeah, the Cromartys, they, they they left because of the people harassing them because That's of the story. It wasn't anything right. else. You know? right. Yeah. And and there was never anything, as far as we know, from before the DeFeos moved in. So. Yeah, so that tells you a lot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so you, you had mentioned that um, you had spent the night at the Lizzie Borden home. And you you probably will get just as many people saying it's haunted as people saying it's not. What are your feelings as far as that bed and breakfast go? Well, things happened there. I mean, there were, again, it's not definitive, but for example, when the, when the person who uh, had me come and stay she said that the that her the dog would never go into the guest room, which is where Abby was murdered. Abby Borden. Okay. The dog just really would never go in; just always skirted the room. Um, and there was something. Oh, the doors between. It's an odd house. You have the guest room, when you're upstairs, and it's really a small house, which definitely goes against Lizzie's story that any stranger was in there and nobody noticed because it's small. Um, and the guest room is kind of attached to, like Lizzie's and Emma's rooms, there's a, a door between them. So it's to, for Emma to get into her own room, she has to go into Lizzie's room. And then there was another door that went into the, you know, her father, Andrew and Abby's room. That one was supposedly always kept locked. So that door often is either locked or unlocked. Um, by itself, that's that's one of the stories that they because there there are tour guides and they'll say, well, I you know I I keep it open because I go back and forth and then I found it locked or or the opposite. Um, there there have been people who've seen uh, like like a misty substance come out of the kitchen where supposedly Lizzie burned a dress. Not supposedly she did burn a dress. Is it the murder dress? Who knows. Um, and she she did it. I mean, there's no doubt. I think there's very little yeah. doubt that she's right. about that part. But um, there there are just odd incidents that have happened there. But again, not definitive. Now, oh, when I went when I was there, they told me guests who had been in, the, and I I stayed in the guest room. They told me guests who had been in there like the week before. Uh, they, the guy woke up and there was an, uh, an older woman who was pulling a blanket over him, you know? So of course I want that to happen. Did it happen? It did not. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> I always have that. I, I was in a room, there was a, a haunted place in, in New Hope here in Pennsylvania. And I was there. Everything was right. It was a, 
It was a lunar eclipse. It was a snowstorm to three feet. I was the only one in the place. Um, I mean, everything was going on that night. And the, the, I think a couple of nights before, a man had, who was staying in the room I was staying in, had said he woke up to feel uh, hands around his neck, which caused him to wet his bed. You know, and, and so he left at three o'clock in the morning. Well, I think if I wet my bed as an adult, I'd say, "Yeah, a ghost was choking me too." <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Nobody <laughs> wants to hear that story unless you put a ghost in it. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> the haunted room. It's a full moon with a lunar eclipse at midnight with a snowstorm. <laughs> oh, I'm surprised. I'm surprised there was no werewolf. If it was a, if it was a full moon. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so I, took a ton of, I think it's potassium and cut down in the calcium. You know, I did all these these things that ghost hunters like to do, and I did get some pretty good orb pictures. I'll say that it's probably the oh, best I've got in, in a, ever. But oh yeah. But nothing happened. I've gotten, to me. I've gotten in a lot of arguments over orbs. That not my. I'm not on my side. Um, you know, people want them to be what they are. And just yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but I did get a good one, so. <laughs> yeah. it choked me in the middle of the night or any of that. It's weird. Every every time I even hear the word orb, I start to shake. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> no! <laughs> Sorry. Well, I don't know that there is or there isn't anything to it. I mean, I know it's been way over-interpreted and overblown, obviously, but you know, that doesn't necessarily take credibility from all such phenomena. So right. I, I'm still in the position of I don't know what it is. And I definitely have seen things, seen them that they're not good dust or a glints of light yeah. or something like that. My, yeah, my, I mean, my favorite one is, is when you get a low resolution shot and then they blow it up and then they see the pixelation. There's pixelation within the orb and they're saying like they see faces or you see a yeah. dog, I know, they I know, see whatever. I Oh, yeah. I, love, I love the ones. These were some ghost hunters years ago. <laughs> we're saying the different colors were their moods. Oh, mood orbs. Oh. Yeah, I remember those. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> See, to me, that's that's what makes it. That's what takes all the credibility out of it. It's just silly stuff like that. Like, yeah. I would, well, I would angry. One, yeah, I, yeah. What if the red one was angry and the blue one yeah. was depressed and you know, as if. So, um, cat. Catherine, here's one for you. I was actually in a Barnes and Noble store, okay. and I was I was looking in the uh, metaphysical section at um, you know for books about ghosts and things like that. And I look and I'm like, what the? And it, it's I I see this book that has this big orb on it, and I look, and the title of the book is Orbs, and I, I'm trying to remember the exact title. But it was like Orbs, their their reason and messages of hope. <laughs> and I That's just kind of was like, That's the orb as angel. Yep. And yeah. it was like, oh, I thought you were going to say orbs, just not for breakfast anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I was in, I was in, uh, I guess the, that that sort of uh, town in Florida that's full of psychics. I can't remember the name of it, but anyway, so so there was one guy who was just showing me his his photo album of orbs <laughs> like they were his grandkids and it was like you gotta be kidding <laughs> one picture after the other. <laughs> you're making me laugh but i can't <laughs> I, yeah there uh, my, my my wife was actually friends with a woman over in australia who that's all she would put up on her page were orbs and then explain what the orbs were doing what who, what the orbs names were and it was just really silly. Um, yeah. Anyway, we, we have, we, I, I we have, I don't we, know that there's nothing to them. I just know they've been way over interpreted. In that's an understatement. Uh, listen, well, we, need to, we need to take, thing. we need to take a break. Uh, so uh, we'll be back in just a few minutes. You're listening to the full spectrum project and we'll see you on the other side. You're listening to WBHM digital broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. 
I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello, I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. This is Jason Bland, host of Midwest Paranormal Presents Paranormal Soup, where we stream live as a webcast every Sunday night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, with guests who will blow your mind. Live ghost box sessions where you can call into the show to see if the spirits will talk to you. And the World Wide Web of Weird, with the latest in paranormal news and evidence. We're bringing the weird every Sunday night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Don't forget to follow and subscribe. You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. And we are back with the Full Spectrum Project. And um, we have been talking to Catherine Ramsland. Um, Catherine, I I had a question um, in regards to the Black Dahlia. Um, I noticed in your in your book, uh, Haunted Crime Scenes, that uh, you had uh, discussed that case in the book. Uh, what exactly uh, did you come up with as far as the Black Dahlia was concerned? Uh, well, I mean, I first did the Black Dahlia case for John Douglas, uh, the okay. FBI profiler, because we okay. he, wrote, he wrote a book called The Cases That Haunt Us, and I did the research on that for him. Later... Is he the one that worked with uh, uh, Harnish from the L.A. Times? No. No? Okay. Uh, and then I did this with another FBI profiler, Greg McCrary. We did a, um, a profile of it for the Crime Library, which is Court TV's website. So between the two of them, I had quite a bit of information be- way before any of the haunting stuff came along. And then, of course, I heard about her ghost showing up in the, in the hotel and doesn't show up at that particular place where her body was. Um, yeah. So, but do, do I think, you know, I don't know who murdered her and I don't think Hodel's father murdered her. I, I think the... Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was that for me or yeah. somebody else? No, when you said you don't think it was Hodel's father, that oh, that, so used, that drives me up a wall. The pictures are, don't even look like her. Exactly. No, it doesn't. It sounds like a lot of father issues, as far as I'm concerned. Every time I've seen, I've heard him speak. Yeah. Uh, w- one of one of the reasons I asked, and uh, for some reason, uh, Mr. Harnish's uh, first name is is slipping my mind. Um, I talked to him when I was writing a piece for my Hollywood Obscura book. And he had gotten together with an FBI profiler, which is why I asked if this was the same uh, profiler. And did you, in your investigations, did you happen to hear of a doctor by the name of Walter Alonzo Bailey? No. Harnish had had that, what's that? I mean, I read Harnish's book. Yeah. Uh, And so him and the, uh, this, and he wouldn't tell me the FBI profiler's name well, but, but that couldn't have been a profiler because because of what the time period he could have been an agent i don't think he well a, he w- when i was talking to him he said profiler uh so i'm only going by what he said um but what, well, what it, time period was this um if i remember right it was uh mid 80s if i remember correctly i doubt he talked to a profiler on that one and certainly not a profiler who investigated that case 
But he certainly yeah. could talk to an FBI agent out in California or something, you know, easily. I, I guess it's possible. Like I said, I'm only go, I'm only going by what he said. Okay. But the but the reason I was asking is uh, because of what um, he said, the connections they found with uh, Dr. Bailey and Elizabeth Short's sister being married at Bailey's house, them having a connection with the family, uh, Bailey's uh, office being right around the corner from. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, I remember that one. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I remember that. Uh huh. And and where do you want to go with that? No, I was just wondering what you thought, whether you'd heard about it, and what you thought about it. I have heard of it. I've heard so many stories about Elizabeth Short mm -hmm. and, and who really killed her that I don't know that we're going to find out. I really don't know. I actually yeah. thought Har Harnish had a great suspect who. Died in the fire. Hmm. He never mentioned anything about a fire. In the book. In his book. Well, I, yeah, I didn't read his book. I actually oh. talked to him on the phone. Um, oh, his book, he had a suspect that he was about to meet who was going to give him some things to prove he was the guy. And he, he fell asleep smoking and died in the hotel fire. Now, I do remember something about a suspect who had died in a fire. Yeah, that guy. Yeah. Okay. I can't remember his name, but... Um, I thought that was a pretty good suspect. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and there, there's also... There's a woman who, who, who wrote that her father was the killer. Oh, yeah. I mean, there are... And, and just, just recently... Yeah. I, yeah. Just recently, like, there was... A, like I think a lot of folks tried to... Try to uh, Try try to uh, uh, throw their hat in the ring, yep. see what they can get from it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And like I said, just recently, I, I believe it was somebody from England wrote a book, and it was all over the news that the murderer had been found, and it was a uh, open and shut. This is definitely the person, and it was out for like three weeks, and then just disappeared. Yeah, like, like Zodiac. Everybody knows who it was. It was like yeah. Jeffrey's DNA. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly there's been at least three different dna samples for jack the ripper <laughs> they don't and they're not the same person oh yeah. don't forget don't forget don't forget uh the people that think that there's a jeweler ripper instead of jack yeah and and also they many jacks multiple jacks yes. together yeah, yeah and, and, and uh, media, they blame the media for clustering and putting that. all those together yeah yeah, so, and and H. H. Holmes is actually Jack the Ripper. No. Well, no, I'm yeah. just saying that that's, I know. I know. that's I know. what they're. Yeah. You know. Well, uh, so if, as far as Jack the Ripper, uh, what have you? What did you discover when when checking into that case? <laughs> we don't have anywhere near enough time to talk about that. <laughs> uh -oh. well, well, we can have this. I don't even know that the five yeah. victims claiming to claim to be Jack Ripper's were all Jack Ripper's victims because one was killed inside, four were outside. There could be others that are not included in the canonical five. When mm -hmm. I was in Whitechapel, I didn't agree with the way uh, some, and, and I'm not the only one. Many Ripperologists agree that maybe the police got it wrong. Um, mm -hmm. in the, you know, back in 1888 when they didn't have really yeah. any resources. So they were just mm -hmm. throwing things together uh, and that maybe some of this was done wrong. I think Elizabeth Stride might not even be a Jack the Ripper victim. That she was on the double event night. So a, way too little time for a very complex case. So uh, maybe we could have you back to do a, a show just on Jack the Ripper. Maybe. That would, that would be a lot of fun. I would love to do that show. Um, okay, so... Since we don't have time for Jack the Ripper, um, do we have some time for, because uh, you're only with us for an hour, so do we have time for um, Wilderness Heights? Starvation Heights uh, was the name of the book that was written about that. Well, I mean, there's not a lot to say except that this is a female doctor who was murdering patients to get their you know, luring rich, wealthy people to her sanitarium uh, to get a hold of their money 
essentially, <laughs> and starving them to death uh, as therapy, and that you and that there are hauntings there. But I, you know, I don't know what more there is to say about it. There's nothing. There's nothing unclear about the fact that she was doing this and that several people died under her hands. Right. Right. Well, so the so-called asylum is now gone and there is actually I, I believe they built um, a private residence there. And I guess he, the person that owns that residence has been reporting things happening. Do you yeah. think there's do you think there's actually things happening there or do you think he's just making stuff up to try and ride the paranormal wave to get on TV. Well, I think there's a lot of a lot to be said for residual trauma that manifests as something that people interpret to be ghosts but could simply be emotional pain because there would have been a lot of mo emotional pain as these people were starving to death and then finding themselves trapped and unable to get word out to anybody to come and rescue them. So I think I think that there there certainly would be very thick emotional uh, trauma residue there, for sure. And he could easily be experiencing some of that. That, that doesn't necessarily make it, make it a, a ghost story, but I think you know you can certainly make the case that it might be. Well, and if they and if they identify it with anything of the uh, on the story, then that's going to cause uh, anxiety or they're reliving anything of theirs and. And then they'll think they'll they'll just think of maybe uh, what they're experiencing is uh, is what had happened to them, but it could just be them recalling their own trauma. And it could be that there's a movie deal in place. <laughs> well, that too, that too. Yeah, With a that, couple of bottles of wine. That's what I was kind of wondering is whether there was a movie deal or a TV deal or or something like that. Deal in place. Yeah. Um, that, you, you had mentioned something about these people starving to death and not being able to get word out for anybody to come save them. W was the, and I, I'm sorry, I cannot remember the uh, perpetrator's name, but was she the only one that was kind of keeping these people prisoner or? She had, I, some, she had some handy men too. Um, so who knows how much, I mean, I don't think they were ever uh, prosecuted as accomplices, but who knows how much they knew? I think, in fact, it was as I as I recall, because it's not a story I you know it's a story I wrote long ago. Um, mm -hmm. As I recall, one of the starving women managed to get one of the caretakers to take a message, and and one of and one of them who lived was rescued because they were able to get a message off the island, and that's how the whole thing blew up and and was found out yeah because it, it just seems kind of odd to me that i mean to starve to death you really have to get skinny they um, were you should see the photos they're horrible yeah they, i mean they, i can imagine like you know, it, yeah they look like they've been in concentration camps right oh, so you her, have name, to, her name was linda hazard linda burfield hazard so dr hazard anyone who goes to dr hazard should already see the problems with that. Yeah, um, yeah. exactly. It yeah. was someone who managed to get, I think it was a caretaker, to, to contact people uh, that she knew, begging for them to come and get her. And I, I think she was there with her sister, and her sister died. So that's really how it all got exposed. And then, but there were lots of people who said, hey, I went through the therapy, and, I'm, and I feel great. <laughs> so yeah. that was on her side in terms of she had people who survived um, who thought it was fine. Uh, and there were those who, but the ones who died had money and stuff that she ended up having them sign over to her. So right. it's possible she had some therapy that was fine, but if you weren't rich enough, you, you weren't going to get the real stuff. Right. Gotcha. Well, Catherine, unfortunately, we are out of time, and uh, I understand that you can't uh, hold over until the next um, segment. So, listen, I just wanted to say thank you so much for uh, being with us, yeah, and well. uh, ho hopefully we can have you back to talk about Jack the Ripper. Okay. Have a good All evening, right. everybody. All right. All right. Thank you, Catherine, so much. Thank you, Catherine. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Bye. Bye. All right. So we are going to take a, a quick station break, and we will be back with the Weird World News. 
You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. And Pete, would you like to introduce Angie and our Weird World News? Ladies and gentlemen, Angie Moe and the Weird World News. News, news. <laughs> and you talk about me and my jokes. Wow. <laughs> hey, you got to bring Angie on in the right way. That's true. Aww. Thank you. Good evening, y'all. How are y'all? Doing great, Angie. How about yourself? I am okay. I'm okay. <laughs> well, hopefully you'll be better. I'm okay. You're okay. We're okay. It's been a day, but you know, that's okay because now I am with my people and we've learned about some really interesting stuff and it's, it's been good. So it's a good way to round out my evening. Good. I'm All right, glad so we can help. This. I've got some weird ones for y'all tonight. All right. Okay. Workers in Mexico City contributed to the sewage when they came upon a six-foot-tall giant rat while dredging the sewer to clear it of an estimated 22 tons of litter following a storm. Oh, Wait, oh, uh, how big of a rat was that? Uh, it was six feet tall. Holy. That well, would scare... <laughs> While on their subterranean cleanup duty, the crew turned a corner in the tunnels and stumbled upon the creature who was hunched over and soaking wet. Only after recovering from their near heart attacks did the gentlemen discover that it was, in fact, not a real rat. Oh, thank God. Awesome. It was actually an alligator. It was an alligator in rat's clothing. (laughs) Lucky for everyone, Evelyn Lopez has come forward and claimed the vermin, explaining that the disturbingly realistic rodent is actually a Halloween prop that got washed away from her warehouse in a catastrophic flood several years ago. Oh, man. The rat was brought to the surface. I'm glad glad we didn't go to that one. (laughs) (laughs) Um. Well, there are videos that are floating around on the internet of the, uh, the they oh, the brought r- the rat to the surface, and there's video floating around of it being hosed off by the city workers. Of course. So, I mean, you can you can find it, and it it really does look real. At least the one picture of him hosing it off, they show some other photos too, and you can tell that it's a prop. But the one where the guy's standing next to it with the the hose that's like uh, truck fed water. It it's very shocking. <laughs> do, um, do they ha- do they happen to say what they have done with this prop? Yeah, well, they're having a sale of sausage out there now. Miss <laughs> yeah. Lopez said that she isn't sure she wants it back, even if it does get washed off several more times. Um, <sighs> Personally, I'm disappointed that Splinter doesn't actually exist, or in this case, Astiga. So, so I'm wondering, was it actually in the sewer, or was it in a storm drain? Well, everything says sewer, but, you know, for people, especially like, you know, down in Houston and and areas like that, there's a huge distinction between sewer and storm drain, you know? And so I don't, I mean, I've never been to Mexico city. Um, some of the other places I've been to in Mexico, there doesn't appear to be a difference. Oh, okay. So it just depends on what you want to name it that day then, I guess. And I, I'm also assuming it depends on your location, you know, the, you know, it looks a lot different in Chihuahua, too, which is where I've spent a lot of time yeah, as well. Chihuahuas are usually smaller, aren't they? Yeah, they're, they're actually really small, and they yip a yeah. lot. Yeah. But I thought it was pronounced Chihuahua. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah? No? Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Watch out. And, you, and, and you got quiet, so I have a feeling there's going to be some bullets <laughs> flying here in a second. A 54-year-old man in Massachusetts died from overconsumption of black licorice. He oh, collapsed in a fast food restaurant after going into ventricular fibula- fibrillation 
was taken to the ER where he died a day and a half later. His family said the construction worker already had a poor diet, which consisted mostly of candy. He ate several packages a day and had recently switched from fruit-flavored candies to black licorice. See, I always knew black licorice could kill. One One taste and you should know that. Well, yes, and I'm actually going to explain it to you, and I'm going to pronounce it correctly because I practiced the word. Oh, um, <laughs> which means we won't understand it. But go ahead. I bet I do. I bet you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Glyceritinic acid is produced when converted from a different acid type, and it's found in licorice-flavored soft candies and interferes with body's potassium level regulation as well as causing heart rhythm issues. Oh, beautiful. So that's what happened to dude here. The effects are not typically deadly, obviously, um, although it can take the body up to two weeks to purge the harmful amounts. So why would they even put that in candy? Because the guy pretty much lived off of it for three weeks. So, I mean, under... Any normal circumstances, it's not going to cause problems. I mean, he he literally overdosed on it. Uh, and I've never because of, his, because of his poor diet that apparently he'd had his entire life, it's possible that there were some pre-existing conditions that didn't show up or no one knew about. Right. Um, now they asked a bunch of questions uh, because he he went into like multi-organ failure. And so they couldn't save his life. Um, and they asked a whole bunch of different questions about, you know, his diet and pre-existing conditions and stuff. And that's how they narrowed it down to the to the black licorice. Well, I've never been able to understand why somebody would want to eat a piece of candy that tastes like anise. And it's, it's just like, ooh, I can't stand the stuff when I walk by it when it's growing wild. Why would you eat it? I... You know, uh, don't know. I don't like red licorice. I think it's disgusting. So, I think if I remember right, red licorice is basically just uh, kind of like a strawberry flavor, isn't it? I don't know. I I can't. I mean, I I don't keep it in my mouth. It. I've tried a few times. I just can't. I don't know. I, Black licorice. I I don't really have a problem with, but I don't really like it either. <laughs> if I'm honest. Yeah, I don't. I don't mind like Twizzlers and the red licorice, but no, never black. Uh. Uh-uh. Um, Sergey Tarop. You want a real? Said, you want a really nasty shot? You want a really nasty shot? There's something called a jelly bean, and it's got heavy anise in it. And uh, I didn't say anise; I said anise. And uh, yeah, and uh, it tastes exactly like a black jelly bean, and it will get you sick. I learned that one night. Does it have Galliano in it? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think so. By the way, and I had two of them, and uh, it, it, I was, t- I was in the bathroom. Uh, it was horrible. Uh, it was horrible. Uh, yeah, it okay. Was horrible. Yeah. So you probably have a lot of like flashbacks. <laughs> from uh, yeah. Uh, anytime I, I anytime I smell black jelly bean, I, I the little, a little bit comes on the back of my throat. You uh, know? Okay. So we, we 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 don't do that. Pete, does the word does do the initials TMI mean any? No, I, I I can get I can get more uh, information in there if you want. You know, really no, just thank you. I, I, uh, I like sh- I like sharing with you guys, but go ahead, Angie. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sergey Tarop, also known as Vissarion, got a free helicopter ride the other day when he was picked up from his Siberian compound by a team of agents from multiple authorities. They are being charged with operation of an illegal religious organization, extortion, and abuse. He runs the Church of the Last Testament. <laughs> <laughs> he runs the Church of the Last Testament, which is a cult-like organization with a self-sufficient village that kind of reminds me of Midsommar, if you've seen that movie. Um, no. no. Oh, you have to watch it. It's so twisted and so good. Um, he claims Co- he is the... <laughs> com- coming from you, though, about it being twisted and you doing the weird world news, I'm worried. <laughs> yeah. 
And you you should be able to trust my opinion and know I that do. It's I do, and that it would I be do. really great. I know I, it, it's it, it's the it's the gunfire I worry about. <laughs> uh, Me too. So I think well, the last time I watched it, it was on Amazon Prime, and it was like free with the Prime membership. So okay, you, you I got that. Like and what's the name of it again? Midsummer. Midsummer. Okay. So it's like midsummer, but it's midsummer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Cool. He, he, he claims he is the reincarnated form of Jesus Christ, and about four thousand people who believe him live in the commune. He has another estimated six thousand followers worldwide. Um, wow. This gentleman and his followers do not eat meat, use alcohol or tobacco, or use money. The mission of the group is to unite all the world's religions. But he claims he can heal cancer and AIDS just by touching a person. Okay, yeah. then. Um, there, and what is his <laughs> success rate? Uh, I could not find that information. Um, okay. There is a lot of info about this guy and the Church of the Last Testament and the rest of the cult stuff. And there's also a very bizarre documentary video that I found. Um, and I know that there are a lot of cult enthusiasts out there, and maybe some are listening. So you hadn't heard about this guy and his group until now. Now you have. Go crazy with it. <laughs> um, but one of the things is, you know, people haven't really figured out why they decided to go after him now. Because apparently he's been doing this since 1991. And, you know, the the... Orthodox Church knew of the existence and they, you know, denounced it, but they've pretty much left him alone until all of a sudden now. And, but they got him and two of his uh, aides or assistants or whatever you want to call them. Um, right. But yeah, so hoping the abuse part is not, did not happen. Um, Oh, okay. So you remember a couple of weeks ago when I told you the story about the two guys who went out fishing and got lost and ended up on an uninhabited island, like a, a hundred kilometers from their intended destination, the ones that were missing for like five days? Yes. Uh, well, dude didn't learn because guess who's missing again? Oh my God. The same two? Yep. Well, just the one guy, the, the guy who owned the boat. Um, he's a 57 year old guy from what? well, what one, one guy learned, right? Exactly, and and he should be praised for that. <laughs> um, because the the police commissioner is pissed. Um, uh, you, now you got to go spend all that money to go get the dumbasses out there on the uh, on the lake, on the uh, island. Well, and he is quoted with saying, "That's what we're obligated to do." It does not come cheaply. These efforts always come at a cost to the community, but we have an obligation to ensure the safety of everybody, and we'll be doing that today. Well, if they he, just leave it there, they don't have to spend the money. I mean, well, it's twice. You know well, what they should? You know what they should do is just fly a fly a Coast Guard helicopter out there. Yeah, and drop, drop them the, supplies. Drop, drop drop them some supplies and say that go that way. But see, that wasn't going to work because at 5 a.m. on Tuesday, okay. he called He called police to say that his boat, and this is the same one from before that had engine trouble, right. was, was taking on water. And he gave his location and said that he needed rescue. Uh -huh. But authorities have been searching and have not found a single thing as of yet. But it gets better. So dude's been living on the ship, or a ship, it's a boat, it's a little boat. He's been living on the boat since the last rescue. But on Saturday, he ran it aground. <sighs> and when the tide came back in, he was able to, like, dislodge it or whatever. And it was supposed to be okay. And so he was able to get it unstuck and said it was fine. So then on Monday... The until, you're, until, you're, until you're ass deep in bailing water and wondering where the cell phone is. Yeah, you know, I I don't know. I, I This guy just has really bad luck. So, He's a dumbass. Well, yeah, I was going to say, it, it might not be luck. He just might be dumb. 
I was trying to be nice. So <laughs> oh, okay. sorry. I'll be nice. Go ahead. Okay. So the causeway to the island where this harbor was, they closed it down on Monday because of high winds in excess of 100 kilometers per hour. And so that was Monday, and he called Tuesday at 5 a.m. So it doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound good at all. But yeah, you know, it makes you wonder. I'm I'm not a I'm not a boater, um, even though I live fairly close to the ocean. I'm only a couple miles. But does to take a boat out? Does it require any kind of a license or um, uh, te- aptitude learning test. aptitude? Aptitude? Anything like that? Yeah. Or can anybody not just this- hop on a Why- boat and go? I only know Texas law, and the answer to that is no. You do have to be, I believe, 16 or over. Maybe it's 18. I I don't know. <clears throat> but, no, you don't have to have a boater's license. That just seems weird to me, and this guy would be a good reason to maybe institute that. I have no idea about Australia, though. I don't I'm, – I'm guessing that their laws in, in that way are probably even more – lenient than ours here only if you hand them up fosters so i have stereotyping (laughs) yeah i know have they found them yet or did they find any boat or what they they haven't found a thing there is absolutely no trace of the guy i'm sorry to hear that that doesn't sound good yeah yeah i mean i i'm not happy obviously you know i i i I was happy to. I, I, find I, yeah, I was keeping earlier, but I mean, I, I don't like anything happening to anybody. And that, yeah. that, that doesn't sound I mean, good. I was happy to find the story until I found out that they hadn't found any trace of the guy at all. But, um, you know, I, I, I'm picturing like the Truman Show in my head for some reason. But, <laughs> well, I thought well, that I, was I, the gay thing. That's all I got for y'all today. I want to thank you for listening to the Full Spectrum Project's Weird World News on WBHMDB, Birmingham, Alabama. And with that, let's get back to Brian and Pete. Well, thank Thank you, you, Angie. That was um, strange, as as usual. (laughs) You're welcome. But, but, hey, you know what? It's strange in a fun way. We we, we wouldn't want to be without it. Good. Hey, Brian. Brian. Hey. You just had a book that just dropped, uh, The Hauntings of Calico. Am I correct? Um, yes and no. Yes and no? Yes. I just, I just had a book published uh, right. called Go- Ghosts and Legends of Calico. Oh, I'm sorry. Ghosts and Legends of Calico. Ghosts and Legends of Calico. California. Um, California. Now, yes. the, this book, of, um, of all the ones that uh, I've written before, believe it or not, I think this one I had the most fun writing. Now, with Universal Studios, it was a lot of fun because, you know, I had to get year-long passes. And my daughter, my wife, and I, we would actually have to go and, you know, go on rides and walk around and see the shows and take the tours. It was Horrid. I mean, what about horrid. What, what about Carmel? Was he there? Actually, no. You know what? He never went. No. Which no, which kind of surprised me. Um, huh. And actually, um, I don't think he's ever been to Calico either. But that sounds that's a good, that should be your next trip. Yeah, um, I'm definitely thinking about it. Uh, hopefully, uh, we're going to get a get a book signing uh, going out at Calico uh, maybe sometime next month. Awesome. Um, that is, uh, San Bernardino County is still kind of on lockdown from uh, all of the COVID. Uh, okay. But we're, we're, we're hopeful that we can at least get um, kind of a, an impromptu book signing at the uh, uh, Calico Print, which is going to be the store that's going to be carrying it uh, actually oh, in okay. the town. Oh, okay. But now, one of the reasons that I had so much fun with Calico, it's a little bit of a drive. Uh, you know, so, uh, Terry and I would get a hotel room out in Barstow and then head out to Calico. Mm -hmm. And for me, um, I, because I'm a a historian, the whole, uh, wild west, a lot of things, but yeah, historians. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, you want to see what I some of the his? Never mind. No, uh, no, no. But by the way, I have a full history on brothels and the. And, and never mind. Um, but that's what worries me. Is that oh, is that why I keep getting uh, bills? Never mind. Uh, I, I, yeah. No. Okay. Um, they're, 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 dam- they're, they're, bill- they're bills of damage from these different places that you're talking about. Oh, no. Th- th- those are from Wyatt. Trust oh, me. Okay. Those are from Wyatt. Damn it. Um, but no, anyway. That little book I, got me about a, is in, in about a two grand now, by the way. Oh, I'm going to have to pay him more to make sure you get more bills. Pay him more? How about I paying mean, me I mean, I mean, the bills? I mean, stop, stop him. I, I'll, I'll stop him. Don't worry. Yeah, um, anyway, work, and that's um, what, and that's worked how, how well so far. He doesn't listen. Okay. Um, um, so we need to take a quick break, but uh, I'll continue with what I was talking about as soon as we get back. Uh, you're listening to the Full Spectrum Project, and we will see you on the other side of the uh, break. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham. Alabama. Paratalk Radio is your one stop for all things paranormal, the unknown, and the supernatural. Join us every Monday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central for discussions and guests on topics such as ghosts, hauntings, Bigfoot, UFOs, and more. This broadcast is rated M for mature and intended for listeners over 16 on paratalkradio.com. Come on, I'm Southern, but, um, nope. That'll do. Hello, I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcast. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. And you are back with the Full Spectrum Project. And um, unfortunately, our guests could only join us for for, uh, the first hour. So uh, Pete decided that we should talk about my new book, Ghosts and Legends of Calico, um, and unfortunately, I mean, Pete, you know me, I hate talking about myself. I cannot stand it. I can't stand talking yeah, about it. And, and I can't stand it either. But I mean, you know, I figure we, we could at least talk about it because it sounded interesting. Uh, okay. You know, you, you, you twisted my arm. I'll talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Virtually. You know, <laughs> of course. And you're yeah, over exactly. there in California. The wrong exactly. Time, uh, well, actually, I, the sun's still up. It's still a beautiful day. Um, I hear in Texas where you are, it's raining and dark. And I, you know, how, I, hey, how are the fires going on out there? 
Uh, luckily, nowhere near me. My daughter, however, was almost evacuated. Uh, but oh, wow. luckily, the uh, the fire shifted, uh, so she's safe, just not breathing real well. Sorry, I, oh, I I will tell you there for a while though. Uh, we would come out in the morning, and uh, our car was just covered in ash. I would imagine. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's gotten really bad, especially up in the uh, uh, eastern Sierra. Um, all right, so anyway, getting the back. The photos kind of look really cool with the, uh, the orange background and stuff. I mean, I know that's with the fire and stuff, but the photos oh, look cool. Yeah, um, up by Lee Vining, which um, people who don't know California uh, would be coming out the back side of Yosemite. Uh, it was like four. I saw a picture. It was like four o'clock in the afternoon when the sun should still be shining and it was almost like it was nighttime and orange it yeah. was it was just horrid bizarre yeah um we're we're hoping that it it'll finally um subside and uh, our governor will finally decide to spend a little money on on uh, you know cutting back and and doing fire breaks but um he basically only wants money going into his own pocket but that's something else um <clears throat> okay, so anyway, back to uh, Ghosts and Legends of Calico. Uh, what I was saying was is that I had a lot of fun doing research on this. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with, um, and they actually call it America's first theme park, uh, Knott's Berry Farm. Are you familiar with yeah. it? Yeah, I'm familiar with the Knott's Berry Farm and with Knott's Scary Farm when they do the uh, October thing. Right, and I believe not Scary Farm was the first to actually. The last few years. Uh, well, they're not doing it this year, but. Well, yeah, um, she's been there the last few years. Yeah, she, she does. She, goes, she has. Right, she goes there a lot. Yeah. So, um, in the theme park itself, it started off as Calico Ghost Town, and the reason. It did was because Walter Knott. What's that? At Knott's Berry Farm. Yeah the 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 original Knott's Berry Farm. Um, right. He was trying to figure out a way to to for people to come to his uh, berry stand and okay. be able to to be entertained at the same time because his wife was serving chicken dinners and they were making some money on that and they were uh, so many people would come for her chicken dinners that they would have to wait in line. And so Walter Knott was trying to figure out how to um, entertain uh, the people as they waited. So he started to uh, build this ghost town uh, that people could walk through as they waited to be called for their meals. And he called it Calico Ghost Town. And so Calico the, was, was built by Knott's Berry Farm. Is that what you're saying? No. So okay. the, re the reason that he called it Calico Ghost Town was because mm -hmm. when he was a, when he was a young man right. he actually he actually worked at the original Calico. Oh, got you. Okay. So okay. that was an homage to the original Calico. Exactly. Um, okay. okay. He, right. he he had his first farm out in Newberry Springs which is out in the middle of the desert, the Mojave Desert. Um, and to help make ends meet, he went to Calico and uh, became a carpenter. And okay. his his uncle is the one who actually grub staked the first silver claim at Calico. And that's why it's called the Silver King Mine is because uh, his uncle, John King, is the one who grub staked Calico to get everything started. So... Walter Knott just fell in love with Calico, and he eventually bought the town of Calico, and he wanted it to become a museum, and that's what it is today. And then in 1967, if I remember correctly, he turned the entire town over to the city of San Bernardino with the express orders that it would always remain with them unless they did something other than what they're doing with it. So now, even though Calico is officially the um, silver, my brain just had a complete 
brain freeze. It is the official silver ghost town of California, where Bodie is the official gold town of California. Um, but if you go to if you go to Calico now, um, it's like walking into Nuts Berry Farm, but without the rides. So almost every single one of the buildings is either um, a shop. Uh, you have candle shops, leather shops, uh, bookshop, uh, candy store, uh, you name it. Um, but I knew leather Cal- shops and candy stores. That's 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 where I'd go. Yeah, don't forget to go to the leather store and then up to the candy store to get pop rocks. We'll go into that off air. Um, <laughs> I'm scared now. Hold me. You should. You should be. Okay. But I always knew that Calico um, had a reputation for being haunted. As a matter of fact, a few years ago, um, I had gone into the ranger station because the uh, San Bernardino County Rangers are the ones who um, watch over the place. And they have a, <clears throat> excuse me, they have an office, uh, it, believe it or not, in the only, it, it's an original building and it used to be one of the brothels. And that's where they now have their, uh, office. And I remember I going a lot of weird energy in that place. Um, actually, yeah, it does have a bit of haunting activity there. There's a, um, a dark woman, um, uh, that they see standing in front of the, um, building. And it's almost like she's in morning garb. Um, if you try and approach, She'll disappear and reappear now inside the building, looking out of the right side window. And no one's really sure whether she was one of the um, soiled doves, uh, if she was uh, the madam uh, for the uh, brothel. No one's really quite sure who she is. Um, And... Believe it or not, I, when I went in, I wanted to ask the rangers about that. And at the time, the one ranger, she looks up at me with this really um, snide tone in her voice, looks me right in the eye and says, we are a historical ghost town, not a historical town of ghosts. It wouldn't even talk to me. Now, <clears throat> this was a few years back. The last time I, or I should say the first time I went back after that uh, to, to start doing some research on the book to see if there would be enough haunting activity uh, to be able to, you know, fill a book on it. Um, I started talking to the uh, clerks and shopkeepers. I found out literally every single building in this place is haunted. Even the Calico House restaurant which was not even an original building. Um, I mean, it got to the point where I was thinking, all right, I was wondering if I was going to get enough stuff to write about. Now I was trying to figure out how to cut back on what I was going to write about because I didn't have a big enough word count to put everything in. It sounds like you're going to have to have a part two. Um, uh, you know, it it would it would be a lot of fun to do that, um, right? But I I've, I've got other things I want to work on. But um, I mean, believe it or not, um, I found it. Well, yeah. So you know the way I write. It's like half the book is history, uh, half the book is uh, paranormal activity. Um, right. So I found that when I was trying to do research on the book, that there were not a whole lot of books out there that um, talked about the history of Calico, which is really kind of strange because without Calico, that entire area wouldn't even exist the way it is today. So it's kind of odd that Ghosts and Legends of Calico is actually one of the most comprehensive books, not only dealing with the ghosts of Calico, but with the history as well. So I'm kind of proud of that. But one of the strangest things that I found was the Calico Cemetery. Now, and why is that? 
it started off with uh, one child being buried there before silver was even found. All right. Okay. So there's some speculation that that's why the town then decided to put the cemetery there. But over the years, after the town slowly died, um, the a lot of the grave markers uh, were torn down. People actually came in to do grave robbing. Um, and over the years, no one even knew how many people were buried there. Then when it started to become a tourist area in the um, early 1940s, this is before Walter Knott uh, purchased the town, to try and bring people in. I think there were only like two or three residents there and one or two shops that had opened up trying to kind of revive the town as it were. They started putting up gravestones of people who never went to Calico, who never lived in Calico. Uh, Wyatt Earp okay. was supposedly buried there, Doc Holliday, um, and, and all of these famous, is, I, I, I is, think even- it, 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 is, that, I mean, is that true? I mean, because I know out here in, uh, in Houston, there are a lot of places that uh, they say that Bonnie and Clyde were at, but of course, you know, they weren't. Everybody just kind of wanted a piece of it. Yeah, and and that's the same with Calico. Uh, okay. Well, uh, Wyatt Earp, I think, may have visited there once. Okay. But everybody knows that he's buried up in Colma with um, his wife, okay. uh, Joseph Josephine. Okay. Um, Billy the Kid never went to Calico, but he had a grave marker in the Calico Cemetery. Well, they also so, talk about uh, William Bonin having having a uh, his. Billy the Kid, correct? William Bonin. William Bonin, yeah, yeah, that he's that he actually survived um, to a later age. Uh, that I don't know about. I haven't really done the research on I that. Think it, wasn't it? Wasn't it Brushy Bill? Then they claim to be Brushy Bill. Uh, that I'm not sure. Okay, I might have things missed, uh, jumped around or something. You know how age is. Um, no, I don't actually. I'm only 29. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, I uh, don't, don't worry. When I get up to your age, I'll, I'll probably know. Um, but so you've never you have been, to, just remember, Brian, you have to live with yourself. Oh, I'm, I'm good with that. Okay. Just, All right. Yeah. I'm just letting no, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Not a problem. Okay. All right. Um, so, um, for anybody that's actually been to Knott's Berry Farm and seen the Boot Hill, um, they know that most of the headstones in the amusement park are, you know, funny type of um, different things. Um, oh, is that you mean like, uh, it, I told you I was sick kind of thing? Exactly. Okay. Um, okay. You know, uh, here lies Lester Moore, one slug from a 44, no less, no more. Ah, uh, gotcha. gotcha. You know, that type of thing. Okay, all right. So when they started to redo the cemetery, they, and, and they did um, underground imaging to try and find the bodies and then figure out who was where and, and things like that, right. um, they started to, to look at the some of the gravestones that were there, and they're not sure whether Walter Knott had put them up or not. Um, you know, think, the, you think he they, replaced the headstones? Not replace them per se, but just put them up because nobody knew who was buried where. Uh, we, we don't believe that he touched any of the ones that were there, but he may, and, and no one's really sure that he did it or whether some of the Rangers did it. Um, but, you know, like there was one that here lies poker face Harry, a whiz at cards called hearts, fast at draw, too slow, wants to draw. That was the Joker. That that was one of the gravestones they found. Oh wow! Okay. You know, so and oh, and then there were other gravestones that were actually gravestones put there by people. Um, uh -huh. And there was one that was uh, uh, Tom Kate and Tom Kate Jr. Okay. Tom, Tom Kate Tom, Jr. Tom Kate and Tom Kate Jr. 
Okay. So everybody, every, everybody assumed it was um, a father and his son. Yeah. It, it turned out they were both Tomcats. Tomcat. Tomcat. Okay, I got you. But the, instead of putting oh. cat, they put Kate. Oh, okay. I wonder, okay. Well, I was thinking Tomcat in a whole different way. Okay. So they were yeah. actual cats. They were actual cats. Okay. That, that were buried there. Okay. Um, there, there was another one that was just named Bruce, and it turned out it was a dog uh, that had originally been buried in uh, the town of Daggett, which is a few miles away, and then for some odd reason <laughs> dug up and put in the cemetery. No one really knows why. Um, you know, okay. so they've, they've tried over the years to remedy all of this, and there's actually people that are still being buried there today. Um, if you, really? if you go, yeah, if, if you go to the cemetery, uh, there's actually a fairly recent gravestone. If I remember right, it was from two or three years ago and it was a Marine who had been, um, killed in Afghanistan. Okay. And, and they had him buried there at Calico. Okay. Now Calico does have a bit of haunting activity uh, okay. the, the, the cemetery um, there are figures that are seen kind of moving about um, and uh, of course none of this has been verified um, right. and, it, and it usually takes place at dusk um, I think one or two have been spotted like early in the morning um, okay. there's one figure that basically just walks from one side of the cemetery crosses through and disappears. Okay. There, there's another one who, and, and there, there's this really big cross on top of this hill in the cemetery. And there's actually a figure that has been seen. And, and I mean, there have been a lot of reports of this, um, have been seen standing next to the uh, cross that's up there. And as as the people have watched, he just slowly fades away. At least we assume huh. that he's a he. Okay. Um, now, a few years back, there's quite a few years back now, um, okay. I had taken my boy uh, my Boy Scout troop to uh, camp at Calico, and what okay. we used to what we used to do is we would invite the uh, Weebelos, who were going to be coming up into the Boy Scouts on a camping trip with the families. So we could all get to know each other so they could decide to join our troop. And okay. I had, I had already been into, you know, uh, in ghost investigations and we couldn't get into the town because it closes down at night. So okay. I thought, well, I'm just, I'm going to break away from camp and I'm going to go see if, uh, you know, maybe do some EVPs around the cemetery. As I'm walking, I keep hearing something behind me. And I'd kind of turn around. Oh, that was and me. That was you? That was uh, me. I thought as much. I thought it was a grizzly, but, you know. It's, um, Same thing. Well, it, it, it turns out that three of my scouts, one of which was my nephew, were following me. Okay. Now, my okay. nephew already knew what I was doing. So he probably, you know, uh, he knew I was in, into uh, paranormal investigation. So he probably figured I was going to do this. So him and... Uh, two of the older boys started following me and I was like, all right, you know, whatever they're they're They were older. So I told him, I said, all right, well, come on. Well, we got to the cemetery and, uh, the, the gates were closed. So we actually, you know, we weren't going to hop the, the fence to go in. Um, right. so we decided to kind of walk around the outside. Okay. Um, I just noticed that we have to take a break. So I will finish this story as soon as we come back. Um, you, you're listening to the Full Spectrum Project. We're going to take a station identification break, and we will see you on the other side. You're listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Come on, I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello, 
I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. This is Jason Bland, host of Midwest Paranormal Presents Paranormal Soup, where we stream live as a webcast every Sunday night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, with guests who will blow your mind. Live ghost box sessions where you can call into the show to see if the spirits will talk to you. And the World Wide Web of Weird, with the latest in paranormal news and evidence. We're bringing the weird every Sunday night, 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Don't forget to follow and subscribe. You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. And you are back with the Full Spectrum Project. And we have been talking about this really, really good book by this guy by the name of Brian Clune with Bob Davis called Ghosts and Legends of Calico. you got to pick up this book. This man is a fantastic writer. Hey, 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 hey. What? Your nose is growing. Uh, well, hey, if you can't blow your own horn, who's going to blow it for you? I I don't know. You were right. asking me. I don't know. Okay, so uh, when we left for the break, I was uh, talking about a story about going to the Calico Cemetery and being followed by three of my Boy Scouts, one of which was my nephew. Now right. we started and to walk around. Wearing, you were wearing your ghost hat. I was wearing my ghost hat. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, we, we were walking around the outside. Now, now the cemetery is surrounded by a fairly low uh, stone wall. And I was kind of asking questions um, of, you know, any spirit that might be there. And at one point, we were kind of around the back of the uh, cemetery. And I remember asking the question, how do you feel about being buried in such cold, hard earth and you know I, I waited a couple uh few seconds you know to see if there was a response uh, and uh continued walking asking questions and things like that so we finally decided to wrap it up we walked back to our our campsite and um i start to review uh th- the audio and when we come to that question all of a sudden, and I cannot say what was said over over the air, but um, you hear me ask, how do you feel about being buried in the cold, hard earth? And you hear this, F you. <laughs> and, and I mean, it was clear. There was no mistaking this. This person was telling me to F off. My you sure it wasn't scouts, one of your cups to what? I was going to say, you sure it wasn't one of your scouts? I'm pretty sure, yes. But okay. My, Just make my, it three sure. scouts, my three scouts heard this, and I will never let my nephew live this down. And they, mm-hmm. they all three of them got white because they know that there was no voice there when, when I said that. And they literally ran to their tents, and I did not see them the rest of the night. The well, that three worked other, out for the best for you then. It, it really did. And now the three other adults who were there at the time just started cracking up. And they honestly <laughs> did not believe that that was actually an EVP. They were like, how did you do that? I'm, I was trying to explain it. I didn't do anything. You know that. And I'm replaying it for them. That's not my voice. <laughs> they just would not believe me. They thought I had tricked the scouts. Well, I don't know. I've, I've heard you have different voices saying different things towards me. So... I'm on the well, fence on this one. 
<laughs> I'll play you some of the things I've been saying to you, Pete. No, I don't think <laughs> I, I, I think the FCC would be a little upset. Uh, maybe maybe just a slight bit. Just a little bit. Um, so anyway, um, when I when I went back to the cemetery, this was fairly recent, maybe four or five months ago. Um, I was walking around taking some pictures for the book, and I noticed that right about where I had done the e or asked the question that where I got right. the EVP. Right. was the grave of a man by the name of Tumbleweed Harris. Now, well, that sounds like somebody that would tell you where to go. Uh, he might, but Tumbleweed yeah. was, was the most beloved street character ever to walk the streets of Calico. Uh, he passed away in 76, I believe. I'm sorry uh, to hear that. I'm not sure of the year, but... Um, okay. He is well known to actually haunt Calico, not necessarily the cemetery, but Calico itself. Well, you said he was a beloved character. I mean, what 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 did he do or what, what type of person was he? From what I understand, he, he was a wonderful person. Oh, okay. uh, he, he started off working at Knott's Berry Farm. Okay. And when Walter Knott opened up Calico as a tourist attraction, he had asked Harris to uh you know come to to calico uh town to help uh usher in a new tourist era basically okay um and so he was he was just this character he had he had a long white beard and mustache a red shirt with white suspenders um and was from what i understand just really jovial he he uh portrayed the uh sheriff uh of the town um, so he was always just wandering around entertaining people and he would actually take the new hires, the people that were hired, uh, mm-hmm. to be, uh, I, I guess what you would call street performers. Um, okay. he would take, he would take them under their wing and, and some of them would call him uh, pop, uh, others would call him, uh, uncle Harris, you know, and just all of these different things. So, I mean, he was really well liked when he when he finally passed one of the things he asked was that anybody that attended his funeral to please uh come uh in their uh character garb okay they actually had to shut the town down during his funeral because every single person who was working at the time or was off work at the time showed up in their garb he was that wow. well, yeah, he was that well liked. That's so um, cool, though. Yeah. And what's really cool about the him haunting Calico. Sounds is, like he's just keeping up with what he did or loved to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, he Now, he actually lived in the town in a, in a building that's called the Dollhouse. Uh, okay. if you, and, and if you ever see the, 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 uh, the photo in the book, you'll understand why they call it the dollhouse. Okay. He is now well known for his spirit sitting down and talking to children and telling them about how Calico used to be uh, as a silver mining town. And then uh, how it grew into, you know, this tourist uh, uh, town. Okay. And there, I, there are just so many reports of children and parents, you know, as saying, you know, what's up with this guy that we can't see, but our kid is like, uh, you know, totally, uh, you know, wrapped up in what this man is saying. Uh-huh. And the kids actually walk away being able to tell their parents things that the kids should not know. So wow. it really, it, it really, you, you have to wonder Okay, with with all of this, all of these reports and the kids knowing things that they shouldn't be know, you almost have to believe that he's still there, um, you know, entertaining the kids. Um, now, parents and people have seen him, but not at the dollhouse. Um, there have been a lot of reports 
of seeing what people believe is Tumbleweed Harris sitting on a bench um, right at the entrance to the town whittling. And huh. it's right where he used to greet people as they would come into town. So, huh. you know, it, it's one of those things where he's been seen so often and doing things that, that he was known to do that, um, you know, am I 100% sure he's there? Of course not. But it does seem like he's still there trying to make sure that uh, uh, the town is taken care of and the guests are entertained, which is kind of a nice thought. You know? Yeah, that, that's yeah, that's real cool. Yeah. Now, I, th- I mentioned when, when, when I started talking about Calico how every single building there had has ghost activity even the one which i i got a kick out of um i went into um i i can't remember what the shop is now but it used to be the uh original uh undertakers building mm-hmm. and um i had my recorder and uh i had, i had mentioned to the clerk uh, what i was you know looking for and he goes there's no paranormal activity here and you need to turn that off so I was like, okay. So I turned it off. And then she starts telling me about all this stuff that's going on, but it's not paranormal activity. I'm like, wait a minute. So you're saying that this thing right here will move across the counter by itself, but it's not paranormal? So no, of course it's not paranormal. <laughs> and it was just well, really what was funny. It, what, was it, what, was his, what was their thought about what it was? She had no clue. But uh, it wasn't okay. paranormal. And it, it was all these different things like that. And I was, ha- I was just really having a hard time to keep from busting up. Um, I was in the candle shop talking to mm-hmm. one of the uh, clerks there. And she was telling me about uh, these parasols that would just start spinning on their own. But if it had been the wind, all the parasols would be spinning in one direction where she said that the parasols will actually spin in all kinds of different directions. So, you know, um, so I get home and I'm, I'm jotting down all this stuff and there wasn't anybody else in the shop when I was talking to this uh, clerk and all of a sudden I hear a whispered female voice say, why does he want to know about us? And I was just kind of like, wait a minute who is asking, you know, why, what does he want to know about, or why does he want to know about us? And I, I finally realized it's like, Oh, this was, this was audible. Well, well it, no, it was an EVP. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I, I got confused. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that that's fine. It's just all of a sudden I realized here I am talking to a clerk about mm-hmm. ghosts and what kind of activity is going on. And all of a sudden I get an EVP which is most likely a spirit asking why I want to know about them. So, I mean, I thought that was totally like, I loved it. Did you ever, Um, ever ever answer the question? See what they say? Well, if I, um, I haven't gone back since. Okay. But you know, I mean, I I will. Um, Now, one one of the uh, managers, uh, Kayla, uh, has been trying to get me to come out. And, uh, she says that the activity, I guess, because Calico is basically closed, you know, it's, it's not closed down. Uh, but because, you know, uh, the whole COVID thing, not a lot of people are, are going up there. And she was telling me that the spirit activity within the town has just completely ramped up. Right. Um, now I don't know whether it it's because there's not that many people, um, coming to the town um, right. or whether, you know, it's because, oh, hey, there's not so many people here. We can, we can, you know, uh, make ourselves known more to the people who are. Right. But, um, yeah, she keeps telling me that, uh, you know, if I want to come up and just hang out in the uh, Calico print for, uh, for the day uh, with my recorders and stuff, uh, I'm more than welcome. So I'm seriously thinking about doing that. So, um Oh, yeah, you know, uh, you, you know uh, I just want to remind our listeners that uh, in November, that uh, if you are in Texas, uh, to come up to Jefferson and uh, Brian 
will probably be there. And I know I will definitely be there. And uh, maybe you can come out and harass us. I plan on kibitzing. Okay. Cool. I, I, I already I already told Jody that I'm I'm gonna harass you. Harass me or harass I'm her? Har- I'm, no, I'm gonna harass you while you're speaking. Me? Yeah, I'm I'm gonna harass you while you're speaking. Ter- well, Terry- I carry a, I, I carry a paint gun behind the behind the uh, the, the podium. So anybody that harasses me gets a, gets a paint gun in the face. That's okay. I used to be a paintballer, so I've been hit. That doesn't bother me. Anyway, okay. we well, we I'll, we. I'll, 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 Go ahead. We need we need to wrap this up. Um, unfortunately, okay. our time's over. Uh, the The name of the book is Ghosts and Legends of Calico. Um, so if if you're interested in something like that, uh, please feel free to check out Amazon or your local bookstore. Now, next week, uh, please join us when we welcome Terrence Zemke to the show to discuss haunted cemeteries and a bunch of haunted locations across America. This should be a, a good one. Um, until then, I am uh, Brian Clune. I am Pete Havlin, and for Angie Mole, we say thank you for listening to us this evening. Absolutely. And again, thank you to our guest, Catherine Ramsland. We hope to see you uh, next week. Thank you so much for listening. You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama.